We're going to continue our series tonight. And I, uh, Pastor called me this afternoon and asked what I was teaching with the teens. And I said, well, we're going through uh, Answers in Genesis, kind of a study on how the Bible is true. And he asked me to teach that tonight. So we're actually on lesson two with our teens. But what I'm going to do is do some review to catch you up. And then we'll kind of finish our lesson tonight, or so that's the plan. And you may be asking, what exactly are we teaching? Am I, uh, we're going to be learning tonight. It's going to be a little bit different of a lesson. won't be uh, open your Bible, uh, hard preaching style. It's going to be more teaching. And the uh, topic of today is, does archaeology support the Bible? Now, I don't claim to be an expert in this field. I've been studying it a little bit here and there in, uh, as we've been teaching Pacific West uh, Baptist College. Some of you students might recognize a couple of these pictures. Maybe I'll call upon you to tell me what it is. Ooh, anybody want me to test the college students tonight? Yeah? How about the one without a tie on? We can, uh, I can ask him. I just had to throw that out there. I think Pastor White's watching tonight, right? So I'll make sure uh, I'll, I'll say everything correctly and properly. Of course, I would do that anyway. But does archaeology support the Bible? It's a very, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, Brother Doug actually he bought he, he gave me a archaeology Bible. I don't remember exactly the name of it, but it's a Bible, and with it shows archaeological finds. It's fascinating, and this study is so so vast. I'm literally going to just skim. Uh, so if I miss one of your favorite archaeological finds, I apologize, but I can't please everybody. But these are just some things. Some of these you 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 haven't seen. Uh, some of them you have, and some of it's just informative. And uh, first question really is, what is archaeology? First of all, how do you spell it? I always get the A and the E backwards, and not that it matters. Maybe I'm homeschooled, but what is archaeology? Is archaeology a professor in school that, uh, that, all, that likes to uh, hunt for buried treasure in deep caves while fighting Nazis? Is that an archaeologist? Uh, I wish. <laughs> if it was, I think there'd be more of us. But archaeology looks a little bit more like this, I suppose. What is archaeology? The study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and the analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. Now, let me quiz you. Patrick, what did I just say? I'm just kidding. So archaeology is basically just the study of history or prehistory as it is. And growing up as a kid, I, I grew up homeschool as well as so was in a Christian curriculum. So my, my, my mentality oftentimes was most archaeologi archaeologists are Christians. Well, that's not really the case. In fact, there's very few archaeologists who are, in fact, Bible believers. Although many, even unsaved archaeologists, still use the Bible as a source because it's quite accurate. And we're going to look at some things today. Now, obviously, you're gonna, you can go on the internet and find people who use archaeology to try to go against God's word, but it doesn't take uh, a, a massive historian to even look into the past and to find that it's accurate. And we're going to look at some things here today. And uh, the teens have seen this first couple of slides, so we'll just do some review, but it's been a couple weeks. You guys probably don't remember much anyway by now. But first thing we looked at was some major evidences regarding Genesis 1 through uh, chapter 11. So we're going to kind of go through the Bible in sections tonight and look at a couple of things. Some, some of these we'll only have maybe one because uh, for sake of time. But major evidences here in Genesis chapter 1. And let's look at this first one here. You may not be able to see that too well. And I'm not going to pronounce these right at all. So don't try to... <laughs> if you want my notes later, I'll just give them to you. But... The Enuma Elish, where's Pastor Devian? He pronounced this correctly earlier. He's probably laughing at me in the lobby right now. But the Enuma Elish, uh, this is the Bab this is nicknamed the Babylonian creation record. That's what it's called. Or some people just nickname it the creation tablet. Now, this one doesn't necessarily, uh, some people use this tablet to try to disprove the Bible. I'll explain that in a second. But what is on this? This is literally, this is just one portion of it. There's, a, there's uh, I guess, four sides to it, and it has a, a story on it. And it's a very old, it's a very old ar uh, artifact that's been found. And it's literally the story of the Babylonians' version of creation. It's kind of cool. 
I mean, we, we're not the only generation that's been wondering how we got here. They've been thinking that since the beginning of time. And I guess not the very beginning of time they would know. Adam knew. <laughs> he, he never doubted where he came from. He knew. But the, uh, this is basically a story uh, that concerns the birth of the gods, lowercase g, and the creation of the universe and human beings from the Babylonian standpoint. It goes on. It, it, it starts out with, the th this, with these three words, in the beginning. It's kind of cool, huh? Or maybe it's not. In the beginning. And transliterated, there was only undifferentiated water swirling in chaos. Out of this swirl, the waters divided into sweet, fresh water, known as the god Apsu, and salty, bitter water, the goddess Tiamat. Once differentiated, the union of these two entities gave birth to the younger gods. I'll just stop the story there. <laughs> it gets weirder, I promise. But as you, as you go in to study the story, it's interesting how it starts out with, in the beginning, and it goes on to talk about how the origin of life started with water and how that water eventually divided. And when you break down the story and when you read Genesis 1-1, there's a huge similarity. So what people say, however, is, well, this came before Moses wrote the law. And we assume that Moses was the author of Genesis, though we don't necessarily know that 100%. But it's just been generationally passed down as it being Moses. And therefore, if this was written before, then the Hebrews gained their intellect. They gained their story, their version from this tablet right here, from the Babylonians, or uh, I guess you could say ancient Sumerian time. And of course, we as Christians would switch that around and say, I think they got it from us. And it's amazing how close it is from God, how close it is to God in his word. When you read Genesis 1.1, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the what? Waters. Moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be lights, and there was light. And you learn in day two that God divided the light uh, from, or excuse me, divided the waters from the firmament, and there's a lot of similarities. So it's kind of neat how uh, some people use it against, but I look at it the other way around. Uh, I have to lift it up here. Or oh, what am I aiming it at? This one, huh? All right, uh, here's another one here. <clears throat> now, this one, you maybe you've heard it before. This is more famous. It's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Anybody heard of that one before? No? Well, you wish you have, but you will tonight. The Epic of Gilgamesh is another story, and it's actually classified as one of the oldest stories ever. Now, obviously, uh, that we have on a, in, in physical form, at least. This is, I'm going to shorten this whole thing here. This is just a fraction of it. But it's basically a, a biblical story of a guy that we know who we believe helped establish the Tower of Babel and who rebelled against the Lord. He was known as a mighty hunter. Anybody know who that is? Of course, I know the teens know because we already talked about this. But I won't bore you with these easy questions. Uh, Nimrod. Story is about a man named Gilgamesh, uh, about Gilgamesh and how he's, uh, he was a big, strong dude, mighty hunter, and he ends up building this tower to reach heaven. And that's what the story is about. And in the story, he actually finds God and he's mad at him and he ends up killing God. This is in the Epic of Gilgamesh and uh, something of that nature. And, uh, but another variational story from a biblical character that we know as, uh, as Nimrod. I'm going to go by quick uh, a lot of these here because we don't have a lot of time. This one right here is called The Long Living Kings at Kish or Sumer. Now, on this tablet, or I don't know, uh, it's not really a cylinder, but uh, whatever you got, I call it a, a rectangle 3D. <laughs> 3D rectangle. That's exactly what that is. Homeschool. Okay, so long living kings at Kish. On this tablet are a list of a bunch of kings, and many of these kings are in the Bible. And I didn't have the list uh, on here, but a lot of them was like... Um, but the, the main problem with this is inside this are actual dates of when these kings ruled and reigned. And on the actual uh, artifact itself, and on these artifacts, going by the dates that were given in this language, would list these kings all the way back as to close to 64,000 years ago. 
So that's kind of a problem because we as cre uh, creationists, especially young earth creationists, we believe the Bible, our world is within 10,000 years, and some believe even almost half that. So this has been kind of a problem for many years, but re in recent, recent years, they have come to actually figure out the mathematical, mathematical uh, equations they were using, they were actually doing it wrong. Uh, and without going into detail that will put you to sleep, basically, they were getting the tens and the, the 60s, uh, the, way, the way some of the x's were structured, they were getting tens and 60s wrong, and when they, were, when they actually calculated it and got it right, it put everything, moved everything back uh, almost 60,000 years and put it right within the time frame of where we've always believed it was in the first place because that's what God said. Pretty amazing, huh? Sometimes it's just the simple things. Now, the, like I said, I'm just skimming. I'm just going over it. There's a lot more of these you can look at later, um, and I can give these uh, the notes to you later if you'd like. So uh, let's move on now. Major ev evidences regarding Genesis 11 through uh, 36. Now, I will say this. Uh, some of these, some of these are, are pretty neat. Some of these are going to really bring out, oh, yeah, I remember that in the story. I remember this. And I remember that. Um, there, we, there isn't uh, archaeological finds that says uh, directly on tablets, uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth. There's nothing that, uh, n nothing quite as explicit that a Christian would love to find. Like if we could find Noah's Ark, that'd be kind of cool, right? If we could find the Ark of the Covenant, those kind of things. Some of these are uh, obscure, and to the average reader, they wouldn't even recognize them as being from God's word. But we as Christians can look into them, and we can see God's hands all along the way in some of these evidences. So just throwing that out there for you. But let's, uh, let's continue on here. <coughs> Uh, you won't recognize that. But this is Abraham's home. And, of course, we know where he's from, right? Where is Abraham's hometown? Anybody remember? Ur. You guys okay? It's clearing your throat. Ur. <laughs> no, you're right. Ur. You are is how you spell it. Ur. Abraham's home city of Ur was excavated by a guy named Sir Leonard Woolley. I kind of wish we could bring back the sirs thing. You're like, Sir Taylor. Don't call me that. Abraham city of Ur. And for the longest time, uh, Ur was not found. They, didn't, they couldn't quite figure out where it was. And they were doubting whether it was true or not. But uh, they have uncovered Ur. And they surprisingly found, at least for its time, it was quite luxurious. If we read God's word and Bible, Abraham was a pretty wealthy guy. He had money. And his father was as well. And so it kind of matches a little bit of customs there. Now, the customs during, the, during Abraham's time, as described in the Bible, are endorsed by archaeological finds, such as, we explained, Ur. Uh, there's other cities, and there's even Nineveh. These were written records from that day, not just put down in, in uh, writing many centuries later, but many of them bear the marks of eyewitnessing reports. So in these sites, they've found tablets that make reference to the way of life in Abraham's time. And it's interesting, in Abraham's time, uh, in, in writings that we have found during in sites such as the city of Ur, you can find instances where somebody who couldn't have children, uh, the hut, who couldn't, uh, who couldn't have, a woman who couldn't have children, now the lineage of that family is at risk, was allowed to go to uh, a servant of, of, of the maid and allow the, the, um, the, cap, the man of the house to have a child through. And it was legal. It wasn't against law. And therefore, was able to keep the lineage rolling. Because having children and having a, a big family, that was, that was one sign of prestigious, of power. And of course, we see that story happening in the times of Abraham. And it's just interesting how those two things correlate there. Uh, this right here is a little statue of, uh, from Ur. It was a king whose name was Namu. He was the king of Ur, uh, who claimed to build a famous tower. <clears throat> uh, in Abraham's time, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be clearing my throat kind of throughout the night, but records of the five kings, <clears throat> there's five kings in the book of Genesis, and these records have been found within excavation sites of these kings existing uh, throughout uh, the time of Abraham. And this is another neat one here. Now, just by looking at it, you may not recognize this, of course. 
Uh, but one of, and you can even Google this uh, on YouTube, and they have videos on the, this group of people called the Hittites. And the Hittites are in the Bible. They're in Genesis chapter uh, 23. And during Abraham's time, <clears throat> Abraham actually negotiates with the king of the Hittites. And in the Bible, we find that the Hittites come from a man named Hatti, H-A-T-T-I. And for the longest time, people doubted whether this group, whether this this ancient civilization actually existed. And it wasn't until, uh, I don't have the exact year on here, but they were able to uncover the site and they were able to figure, find out. And I, I should have given you more pictures, but this is a pretty grand looking little vast uh, palace that they have uncovered that comes from the Hittite people. And these Hittites were, they were pretty luxurious themselves. They had a lot of technology back then. This was during Abraham's time. And their empire would actually grow and increase to a pretty, pretty uh, insurmountable number. So if you ever get bored one day, look up the Hittites and how they discovered them and what kind of people they were. It's pretty fascinating how people doubted their existence all along. But God said they existed. And guess what? They do. We could just trust God's word and uh, save some heartache. Uh, let's keep moving on here. Moving on later in Genesis, we have, uh, I know you can't read that if you could. Uh, come see me afterwards. I got some things I want you to read for me. But we have here, uh, this is an Egyptian tablet. And this is just, uh, just an example of one. But this would be a tablet that a young child would, would uh, have on his lap and he would kind of use to draw with. I don't know that this is exactly what this specific picture is. But if you study and read uh, Egyptian handwriting and Egyptian styles of writing, all throughout these writings, they use phrases uh, such as captain of the guard or overseer or chief of the butlers. Now, this would obviously be transliterated, but these very similar phrases are used. Chief of bakers, father to Pharaoh, father to the gods. Uh, the terms lord of Pharaoh's, uh, lord of the house or ruler of Egypt, like these specific terms are actually used uh, in, in the Bible, and these specific terms are used all throughout Egyptian writing, transliterated, of course. And it's just kind of neat to see, even in Joseph himself, he was given an Egyptian name in the Bible, and I won't even pretend to know how to pronounce it, uh, but I'll try anyway, because I'm competitive. It's uh, Zafnath Penea. Head of the sacred college is what it means. And, and this, you can find this in Genesis chapter 41. Other Egyptian phrases are used, and the style of name given to Joseph in this context is a very similar name that would have been used in Egyptian times. So just, just some uh, small things, but just some interesting correlation between Egypt and uh, the Bible itself. Uh, so let's move on from Genesis over to Exodus now. Some things here in Exodus. And uh, I should ask the teens what, what this one is. But... Uh, but I will. Dennis is smiling right now. He's like, please don't look, don't ask me anything right now. <laughs> In the book of Exodus, historians have argued that the bulk of Israel's laws were written very late. And by that, what I mean is they didn't come into existence until long after Moses' day. So they were arguing that the laws that was that was given by Moses, and you could read Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, read all their rules and regulations, those things could not have come into play until much, much later, way after uh, Moses' time. And, but according to the Bible, Israel started implementing many of these laws and regulations right out of Egypt, and in some cases while they were in, e in Egypt. And they were starting to formulate, while they were wandering in the wilderness, some governmental way of life and some way of thinking. This right here is called the Inushna, Inushna, Inushna Law Code. It's a law code, that's his nickname, the Law Code, uh, dating back to 1900 BC. This, when this little tablet was found, on it reads a whole listing of laws and regulations, many of them very similar to the laws and regulations that you could find in the book of Exodus. Many of them were covenants. There were forms uh, 
And this right here comes around the same timeline of the Hittites. This law code, uh, which Hittites would have been around the time of Abraham, and even goes to much later. On, on some of this, there's laws on there all the way down to uh, the penalty for, for rape. Uh, if you were involved, the penalty for stealing, and uh, all kinds of laws and regulations that historians are saying didn't really come into play until much later. Why they would argue that, I'm not sure. But this uh, archaeological find right here proves that, once again, the things we find in God's word, the laws and regulations that were there, they, uh, they do exist. And they could very well have been made, especially by an all-powerful God who, could, who wanted to make sure his people stayed in the race and didn't get, go extinct, they didn't kill each other, set down these rules and regulations so that they can, too, be the people that God wanted them to be. This one you've probably heard of before, and I love this one. Uh, this, is the e this is Egyptians right here, if you couldn't tell by uh, its style. And the 10 plagues in Exodus. And it, uh, let's name some of them. So we got water into blood. What's another one? Frogs. That's the famous one. Flies, lice, cattle, death, the moraine, boil, death of the firstborn, darkness, two more. What is it? Locust. Locus. One more. Hail and hailstorm. Fire and brimstone, hail. Uh, so we have, there's the 10. If you read and you study Egyptian gods, they worshipped the god of the Nile. They, the Nile River was a god. They worshipped the frogs. I should say they didn't worship the frog itself, but they believed the frogs would, uh, when they, they didn't necessarily worship the frogs, but the frogs were sacred to them. Because the frogs meant fertility. And when the frogs came out, they knew that uh, the, the grass was there, the lily pads were there, that things were growing. So they, they appreciated the frogs very much. I don't think they appreciated the frogs much after that second plague. Uh, the light, uh, lice, you would say, uh, like the locusts, I should say, and the flies. You know, why would you appreciate flies? But once again, uh, living things, breathing things, they, they appreciated them. Some of their gods even look like flies. There's one. Uh, and they have a name for it, and it's kind of it's uh, nicknamed the fly god. But they have different uh, different gods and different things, and it all correlates to God wasn't just throwing out random judgments upon Egypt, but He was attacking their gods specifically, uh, their cattle, the cattle, their way of life. Uh, and many of them have worshipped in some areas in some ways. So it's kind of interesting how God wasn't just randomly attacking Egypt, but He was very pointedly showing them. I am God. The next day, I'm still God. The next day, I'm God. The next day, I'm better than that God too, because that's not even a God. And he would continue down the line. So uh, a little bit interesting there. Uh, let's move on to Joshua now through King Saul. Joshua through Saul. Uh, we have here, and uh, I could ask the college students, because I know you guys totally remember this one. But uh, by the look of their faces, they, they don't. So we have here, the, throughout the Bible, a lot of Canaanite gods are mentioned. And this is kind of for free here. This is a commercial for you. But it, throughout the Bible, you will find this one here is called El, the god, of the, god the head god of the Canaanite pantheons. Uh, he's the fa father of the mortals. And he has a wife. Uh, Asherah, El's, uh, uh, called the Lady of the Sea. And then there's Baal. And Baal being one of the five uh, major Canaanite gods, Baal is called the storm god, god of the, 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 the weather, the, the storm. And why do you think that's interesting? Right? Baal being the god of the weather. And if you remember in Elijah's time, Elijah looked up to the heavens and said, stop rain. Through the power of God, for three and a half years, there was no rain upon the land. Why? Because God, said, uh, because God said stop. For three years, nothing. And then on Mount Carmel, when Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel, and the, and the priests, and they run around and cut themselves you know, all day, crying out, Baal, please send uh, from the sky, bring us that rain, bring fire down, consume. We know nothing happened. And then Elijah stands up. 
Not, he wasn't just against the prophets of Baal, but he was against Baal himself, who, of course, isn't even anything. It's nothing. There is no Baal. It's an it's imaginary thing. But he was, in essence, God versus Baal. And Baal, as we know, you read the Bible, Baal is a false god all throughout the scriptures that people fall down and worship constantly. And when Elijah stood up and said, God, it's your turn now. Once and for all, show them who the real God is. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the altar. But that's not even the best part. The best part is Elijah looks over to Ahab, King Ahab, and says, better grab your umbrella because God is allowing the rain to come now, not Baal. And at God's wishes, God brings the rain back. Just to prove one more time that Ahab's God, or I should say Jezebel's God, Jezebel was uh, not Jewish. She would have been a non-Jew. And many people believe that it was Jezebel that actually brought Baal worship into Israel in the very first place. And we find out as soon as that happened, who is angry and wants to murder Elijah? It's not Ahab. Because Ahab, was, he was brought up a Jew. He knows who God is. He knows who the true God is. And when he saw that, he stepped back and said, oh, wow, what was I thinking? But Jezebel stands up and says, kill him. I want him gone. He can't do that to Baal. And that's when Elijah runs up to the mountain. He kind of goes into depression for a little time. God uh, brings him back, revives him, shows him he's not alone. I'm here for you. But it's just amazing when you put it into perspective, when you study its history, and you find out the storm god isn't really a god at all. It was just God himself the whole time. Uh, we have... Uh, some people say this is a beautiful statue. I, I find this in probably horror movies when you see something like this. <laughs> Apparently it's very expensive. Uh, I don't know if those are real jewels inside her eyes. I'm not sure. This right here is another Canaanite god. Uh, at, uh, of course, the historical book people, they, they know how to, they know this one here. Uh, Ashtoreth is, it's her, her name, I guess, goddess of fertility, war, love, uh, whatever else you want to throw on there. She's the goddess of everything, it seems like. Uh, but what's interesting here is in the Bible, you, would, you see Ashtoreth always alongside of Baal, in the Bible. Now, the name Ashtoreth isn't specifically mentioned per se in uh, all throughout the Bible, but anytime you might see the phrase uh, the grove, you ever heard of that in the Bible? Where a king would stand up and say, tear down Baal and the groves. The groves is actually a, a plant, and oftentimes a plant associated with Ashtoreth. And in many cases, and uh, this is interesting how when God says, don't just destroy Baal, but destroy Baal's assistant, friend, wife, or whatever she is. Destroy the other goddess the, of the groves as well. And get rid of the plants. Get rid of anything that's associated with this wickedness. I don't want it out of my sight. So it's, uh, she's actually seen all throughout uh, the Bible as well, which is kind of interesting. And uh, there are others as well that aren't uh, very important. Um, this right here is interesting, though. We have, uh, this is the city of Hazor, which is called the head of all those kingdoms, according to Joshua chapter 11. Uh, this city was uh, not known to have existed until recently when they were able to excavate it and found out it was the same Hazor as mentioned in Joshua chapter 11. Uh, this is also the same place where when, after King Saul died. Now remember he died, uh, he got hit with an arrow and then he told his servant to kill him but the servant wouldn't so Saul laid on his own sword. Well the enemy found Saul and Jonathan and they cut off his head, and they put one head, if you read the Bible, they kind of split his body, they put uh, his armor over here, and they put his body over in this city, two separate cities. And when you read the Bible, if, you know, you kind of skim over it, but when you really think about it, it's like, why would they, why would they not keep them uh, together? Why would they split them apart? Uh, but when you study uh the enemies back then, the Canaanites, when they would disembowel, when they would win a war, they would do that to their enemies 
It doesn't specifically mention King Saul, but just that ritual was done in their writings. And it's cool how the Bible had already talked about that ritual. So just another small but interesting confirmation that uh, just another accuracy of the culture of the Canaanites back then. Uh, let's keep moving on here. So we have the period of the kings now. We're not going to go all the way through Revelations, okay? So <laughs> just, uh, we're just going to go th just halfway through the Old Testament here. Actually, this is pretty much halfway now. But the period of the kings. And I only got one here for you. And now I know one of you guys know this one. Which one is that? Ah, oh, there it is, Brother Rob. He's like, come on, guys. <laughs> guys, come on. The Moabite stone. All right. The Moabite, I don't know why I'm looking at them. I should be looking at Rob. He had, he had high scores in my class. <laughs> the Moabite stone right there. So this one is a very important uh, part of archaeology here. And it's actually one of the most important extra-biblical correlations with First and Second Kings. In this account, we find the Moabite king, Mesha, and uh, gives in the Moabite stone, he, he explains in this uh, inscription about many of the battles he had won. So this is an actual real Babylonian king called Mesha who had this stone transcribed for him. And because it's in stone, it's been able to be preserved this whole time. And this is actually known as the longest inscription discovered in the eastern Mediterranean coastland. It has uh, uh, 34 lines of perfectly intact written uh, Babylonian language written here. And in this, we find all the, uh, some battles that he won and his close relationship with his lower G god, whose name is Shemash, which you can find throughout the Old Testament. Shemash. Now, I'm going to read to you a small portion transliterated in English, okay, from this stone. Tell me if you recognize any of this. Omri was king of Israel, and he had oppressed Moab for many days, for Shemash was angry with his land. His son succeeded him, and he too said, I will oppress Moab. In my days he spoke thus, but I triumphed over him and over his house, and Israel utterly perished forever. And Omri took possession of the land of Medaba and dwelt in it during his days, and half the days of his son, 40 years. And uh, there's more I could read here. But he's literally referencing specifically King Omri. Now, many of you may not really even know who King Omri is. King Omri, his son, is King Ahab. So Ahab's father is Omri, and he did reign. He only reigned for about 12 years, I believe. But he had a very great kingdom, a vast kingdom, and apparently had relation, not a good relation, but with this king here, Mesha. And this is one of the first times we have somebody in the Bible very specifically mentioned by, an, an, uh, by something that has been found in archaeology. And there's a lot more that's said on here that matches a lot of what we find in 1 Kings chapter 9, where we hear uh, this, uh, that matches some cities from Solomon, such as Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. And uh, just some interesting little parallels that we find here. So more stone, you should look that up sometime. But I'm sure you will. Major evidences regarding the Assyrian period. Uh, we'll go through these ones a little quicker here. Uh, this guy right here, his name is King Sargon of Assyria. And in fact, I want us to turn here. We're going to be looking at this passage at the very end. Look to Isaiah chapter 20 in your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 20. Isaiah chapter 20. Not a very high quality picture, but uh, close enough. Isaiah chapter 20. I'm just going to read one verse. Look in verse 1. It says, In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, and then in parentheses it says, when Sargon, the king of Syria, Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it. and took it. So this verse right here has stumped a lot of people. King Sargon of Assyria? Who's that? We have archaeological uh, tablets and, uh, and listings of kings, and uh, they, have, they, they have a timeline built, and Sargon's not in that timeline. Who is Sargon? 
was Isaiah, did he totally mess up someone's name? Maybe this name is supposed to be somebody else. And many people for the longest time would just skip over this, this part here because Sargon didn't exist for many years. And after critics uh, began challenging this, uh, Sargon's palace was recovered at a city called Korzeban. And in, not only was his palace discovered, but a wall inscription and a library record endorsing the battle against the Philistines bought, fought by Ashdod, exactly mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. So not only was Sargon mentioned, but his battle against Ashdod was inscribed on a wall in his palace that they believed from a guy who didn't actually exist in the first place. So that's a pretty neat one there, how exact replication could take place. Also, the Assyrian title, we found it here in verse 1, it says Tartan, capital T-A-R-T-A-N, Tartan, which means commander-in-chief. And several others are used casually in the Bible, but are mentioned all throughout Assyrian uh, inscriptions on walls, the name Tartan. And it's lo uh, a lot of it's used as a kind of like a surname. So it's kind of interesting. And there are other things we could talk about, but uh, we'll skip ahead here. And this last one from this section, I don't even know if you can see that. It's kind of dark. Um, this one right here, it talks about the death of Sennacherib. And we won't turn there, but Isaiah chapter 37 and 2 Kings chapter 19 uh, records this king Sennacherib and his son Ashharadan and his son Ashurbanipal. These are mentioned in the Bible, and it's interesting how these, I don't think Ashurbanipal is mentioned in the Bible, but the other two are, Sennacherib and Ashharadan. These guys were mentioned. Uh, critics were having trouble putting them in timelines, but because of excavation, They've, they've been able to uncover documents proving the existence of these guys and, of course, where they were and their existence and how it all correlates uh, perfectly. So once again, God's word is, uh, is where, right where it should be all along the way. And I should also, also mention here, around the same time frame, and I don't think you could, you can't really see that, can you? Is it too dark? Too, you can kind of see it maybe? Uh, you look, uh, you probably can't even see this. It's useless. Is the big one up here? Oh, the big one. This one could kill somebody. Okay. Uh, you can probably see this way better than the picture. Uh, let's see here. This is just, I'm not sure what's happening there. This guy right here is, well, I don't know if you can tell. This is like a fin right here. And this he's basically like half man, half fish. Half man, half fish. There's some fishing that's going on here. I don't know. That, oh, it's brighter. I like it. Whoever did that, it's my favorite person right now. So we have these half men, half fish. This inscription comes from Nineveh. And in Nineveh, we find some interesting things that take place. Uh, there is a man by the name of Adon Niharing III, who might have been the same king during the time of Jonah. And the reason we believe this is because when he came to the throne, somewhere in his time frame, his, uh, his, he completely reformed, if I could put it that way. He restructured himself. He changed the way he went about things. And uh, you see a change in his kingdom uh, from archaeology. Not only that, but all throughout, from his point on, we find new gods forming into play, inscriptions with man and fish forming into the picture. And a famous god comes from this time frame, a god called Dagon. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Dagon was a god that Gideon helped kick over at one point. And God said, get out. G Dagon was a fish god, half man, half human. And all around the time that we believe Jonah came about, fish, things started to get fishy, if I could say it that way. And it's interesting how I uh, broke the, I'm um, just going to put that down, how it's interesting and when you look at uh, archaeology, a lot of the Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. In that time frame, we find a symbol all throughout. And I couldn't find a picture of it, but it's kind of, they call it the Nineveh symbol. And it's a symbol of a woman, and in her womb is a, is a fish. And she's the goddess who would give birth to Dagon. But it's interesting how a woman in her womb is a fish. And the small correlations we find with Jonah and uh, his time in the whale. So whether that could be a coincidence or not, maybe it is, I don't know. 
But uh, just threw that one out there for you. You can start a conspiracy if you'd like. Uh, major evidence is here. I think this is our last one here. Regarding uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm just going to skim through these here. Nebuchadnezzar, we knew what he did. He uh, ransacked Jerusalem. He took it captive. Uh, when you read Daniel chapter 4, we know that uh, who Nebuchadnezzar was. He talks a lot about his life. Poor guy had like seven years as a, as a, as a wildebeest or whatever he was. Uh, we know from Babylonian chroni uh, chronicles that the date of Nebuchadnezzar's capture was exactly in correlation with the events we find in God's word. We also find through excavation, I don't have a picture of this either, but Babylonian furnaces is one way that uh, Babylon would use to uh, kill people who spoke out against or did something against their gods. And it was common practice for them to throw them into a furnace. Of course, we know the story with the three Hebrews, how they were thrown into a furnace. Only They were probably the only Babylonians that did not die because God did not want them to. Uh, and for many years, critics would say that there was no such king of Nebuchadnezzar, but nobody doubts his existence now as they've uncovered massive amounts of archaeological structures uh, by Nebuchadnezzar himself. This, uh, oh, that's Nebuchadnezzar. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's actually him, but uh, they call this Nebuchadnezzar the second. So maybe his son looked just like him. I'm not really sure. Major, that we should, uh, we, people have paintings and stuff, but we should just start inscribing sheetrock and walls. That'd be kind of cool. It would last a little longer. It may look strange, but... We have uh, major evidences regarding Cyrus and the Medes and Persians. I said that was the last one, but I guess I was wrong. This right here is called the Cyrus Cylinder. And the Cyrus Cylinder is about a guy named Cyrus. Now, I know that astounded some of you. Look in Isaiah chapter 44. This will be the last passage we're going to look at. Isaiah chapter 44. Now, Cyrus also nicknamed Cyrus the Great. He was one of the guys that was able to overpower and destroy the mighty Babylonian Empire. Cyrus uh, being Persian himself, or the Medes and the Persians. He, and which gave him the title of Cyrus the Great. He was a, a very powerful man. He's found all throughout the Bible, Isaiah 44, we're going to look at that. Second Chronicles 36, and he's in Ezra, all throughout Ezra. Cyrus is the one that gave Ezra permission to go back in, to Jerusalem and to try to rebuild. And this is all from Cyrus. He, was a, he had a great hand uh, with, in helping Israel. Uh, he had a great hand in, in uh, formulating things on this clay tablet. We find uh, some confirmations of some conquests that he was able to conquer, which verified exactly as we see here in the Bible. And we also find in the cylinder that there were some, uh, some, he allowed some of his captors to remain in their hometown, to stay there and live there and keep it running in case he ever needed it someday. And that's exactly what happened in the book of Esther, where many people uh, stayed back home, but many people actually, he allowed his captives to live with him in, uh, around his city, as we find in the book of Esther. Uh, not from Cyrus himself, but Xerxes. Now, look at Isaiah 44. Cyrus the Great, they call him. But look how God, what God calls Cyrus. Uh, look here in verse 24. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth forth the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and make it their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built, and I will rise up the decayed uh, places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up the rivers, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundations shall be laid. God is saying, there is nobody like me. I am the only God that there is. 
Cyrus the Great, he's just my shepherd. He just takes care of my sheep. He's looking after my people. That's exactly what Cyrus did. He single-handedly made sure Israel was safe. Even though Israel was his enemies, they destroyed him. But God said, oh, Cyrus, I know you're great and mighty, but your only reason for existence is just to look after my people for me. You're, you're taking care of my sheep, so thank you for being doing that. And that's, that was his role. That was his place. God is all-powerful, and God is the one in control. Back to verse 25. God frustrates the tokens of the liars. He maketh dividers, diviners mad. He turneth wise men backwards. As we uncover more and more archaeology and more and more of the past, we begin to find that the Bible is more and more true. And more and more things start turning backwards. And people have to turn around and transition themselves. And you could read stories of archaeologists who were unsaved, who through the Bible, who through studies, have come to Christ because the evidence is there. There will always be skeptics. They'll always find things that, oh, but the Bible says this, but this clearly proves this. And there's always going to be skeptics that are going to try their best to disprove the Bible. But let us stay, excuse me, let us stay true and faithful to God and his word. And let us remember who the real God is. And the Dead Sea Scrolls is probably by far the greatest of the finds. And uh, th though it was found on accident back in 1947, we find the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And you can buy the Dead Sea Scroll, Dead sea Scroll book. It's pretty massive. It's, it's, uh, it's a huge chunk of the Bible it was found in these scrolls. The only book that wasn't found was the, yeah, Esther. There's a college student right there. Esther is the only book that wasn't found in this particular scroll, but uh, other scrolls uh, it was found in. But the point being, the Dead Sea Scrolls has almost the entire copy of, of Isaiah uh, placed in here verbatim and many other things that we can uh, look forward to. I won't dwell too, too much detail into this. That's, uh, I believe that's a digital copy of it right there. But it's just amazing how, uh, and you can look up how it was preserved and how God just allowed it to, to be where it's at. And without going too much detail, basically the point is this. Does archaeology prove the Bible? And to answer that, I would have to say, no, it does not prove the Bible. Because for it to prove the Bible would mean that archaeology is the standard. So archaeology does not prove the Bible. Archaeology confirms the Bible. Because the Bible is the standard. So does it prove the Bible? No. Archaeology is, without a doubt, a confirmation that God's word has always been true. Because the Bible is the standard. And when we look at not just confirmations, but people attack and they criticize God's word. And I could go uh, into some more instances here. And like I said, I just did very little arche archaeological finds. There are so many more, and some of them are even cooler that I couldn't uh, put on here. But the Old Testament is an ancient book. It's not a modern rec record. And its styles is that of the East and not of the West. It's those from a time frame in which doesn't exist today. At times, it must be interpreted based on its context and the symbolic and figurative styles of the Jewish of ancient times, and not according to the scientific precisions of our day. The Bible uses the language of phenomena, of, mirac of the miraculous, as when it refers to, uh, for instance, uh, in some cases where it's not uh, correctly scientific, the Bible will use terms like uh, the sun rising in the east. But scientifically speaking, the sun isn't what's rising. It's the earth that's moving. But we understand its context and what it's referring to. Through the Bible is not, is not meant to be a scientific book. The Bible is wonderfully scientific in its astonishing accuracy. And it is something that we can trust in. It's something that we can put our faith in because God wrote it. And God's not going to give us something that we can't trust in. There is value to archaeology for the Bible students, its confirmations, and all the many artifacts that we can find. But let us just stay true and faithful to God and his word. And I just brushed the surface of archaeology. I hope this maybe sparks some interest for you to go and to study on your own and to, and to go and, and dig deeper. And even just uh, as of just a few months ago, they're still finding discoveries that correlate with God and his word. So go out there and study God's word and put your faith and trust in it. 
and let's just enjoy the, the wonderful word of God that he's given to us today. So I hope that this was a blessing to you tonight. And like I said, I just skimmed it. I went a little quick. And if you'd like more information, I'd love to give it to you. And if you have something you'd like to add, I'd love to hear from that because this stuff has uh, really intrigued me the last couple of months. So let's go ahead and pray. Let's give God the glory for this evening. And then we're going to, uh, I think we have another song. We're going to get into our prayer time. And uh, we'll let the Lord have his golden way.